So next we have a panel uh, led by Professor Rob Sokolow. Uh, Professor Sokolow really needs no introduction. He was uh, one of the first uh, faculty members at Princeton who started addressing environmental and energy concerns way back in the early 70s when it was not the hot field that it is today. Uh, if you read uh, this brochure completely, you'll find that uh, Mr. Mader, uh, he credits uh, Professor Sokolov for uh, engendering a lifelong interest in energy uh, when he took uh, Professor Sokolov's undergraduate course. Maybe it was MA 306 or something, uh, complex analysis. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Sokolov, he's uh, a professor emeritus uh, uh, in the uh, Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Uh, he focuses on global carbon management and climate change. He's a co-PI of the Carbon uh, Mitigation Initiative, and he's helped uh, launch uh, research in carbon cycle science, low carbon energy technology, and also policy. Uh, he's very well known with his uh, colleague, uh, Stephen Pakala. He invented stabilization, stabilization wedges, which uh, is a concept that facilitates uh, planning of limited uh, carbon emissions. He's a member, he's an associate of National Research Council of the National Academies. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Physical Society, a fellow of the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, his PhD is from Harvard. Uh, he was given the Leo Zillard Lecturership Award by the American <coughs> Physical Society, and he uh, has been elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So please uh, welcome Professor Sokolov. Yes, well, <clears throat> greetings everyone. What a pleasure to be in this hall and to be talking. I walked in here when things were under construction and said someday I may talk here, and <laughs> here, here's the moment. Um, the, the Technology Distillates Project uh, was invented by Emily Carter, and she and I had been thinking along similar lines, and I said this is exactly what I'd like to do here, um, which was to deal with individual technologies let me for a moment, though, the cap, the, 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 I'm about to tell you about things called distillates. There are three that are done. They have an executive summary and a long form. Executive summaries are out in front, and on that title page, you see the, um, the three of them, the, the top part of each of them, side by side. I'll be telling you about them in a moment. So the distillates themselves, what are we after? Uh, we're trying to capture individual technologies in a way that simply doesn't exist. It should exist, but we're moved, filling a gap, I believe. Um, succinct, substantive, um, multidisciplinary, so it talks about both the technologies, the economics, and the policy issues. Short, and, and um, aimed at a reader with a lot of curiosity, which is in abundance in this town, but it is not necessarily to be taken for granted probably is a, sim a small set of the total population. And then limit the amount of background technology and the te technical uh, information that people have. No equations, even for the most part, no exponents. Make it as accessible as you can for people who are a little s scared of a certain type of thinking, but they're curious, and, they, and, and you bring them in. You bring them in with the glossaries, you bring them in with simplified language, you, with minimum acronyms. You, you, it's a welcoming strategy, which is the opposite of what most of us do when we're writing for each other. And then uh, finally, <coughs> I made up this phrase for this particular talk, ring out the hype. I think Eggman a moment ago was saying, saying something similar. There is so much boosting of whatever somebody is doing. Some of it is self-deception. You've got to believe in what you're doing in order to get, get it done. And some of it is marketing. And to the extent that you can get both of those to a minimize them. It's to the good. Uh, at least it's to the good in our view, and it's very much part of what we've been about. Low-key understatement, having a little challenge as we write press releases where people immediately go to hype and try to find that balance that makes it sensible. So each report, ha each distillate has a 40-page report on the web, 40 pages or so, and executive summaries, I said, they're printed here. The first three, done roughly a year apart, or on grid storage, on small modular nuclear reactors, and on fusion. And um, we have two in the works right now, one on mid-scale solar, taking as a jumping-off point Princeton University's 
five megawatt solar installation, which is nearly invisible on this campus, to our shame, I believe, and wind and wind farms, uh, which is, uh, they're both going to be very interesting when we do them, uh, when we get them done, and, and please uh, read them. So the grid scale storage had seven players. Uh, three were faculty members, uh, Craig Arnold and Dan Steingart. Dan's talk to you here are batteries guys. Warren Powell is a grids guy. And we came upon, uh, we, we were really onto something important, more important than I realized when we picked the topic. It's clear that wind and solar have an enormous, so far mostly hidden cost in their inter intermittency um, that will thwart their dominance until we handle it, and we're going to be handling it, but it's not going to be cheap. Um, gas and hydro are the unsung heroes today that are enabling, uh, um, enabling intermittency to penetrate the system, and batteries are competing against those two solutions and have a long way to go. Now, we, Ellen Williams was telling me uh, on Wednesday night, no, no, we're, we're going to get there quite a lot faster than you think, Rob. May it be so. Um, and then we realized also that there, there really are three frontiers of batteries, one for long-term storage, multi-hour, one for the very short-term storage that is involved in grids to take care of uh, uh, fluctuations on the order of a second, where, where flywheels, batteries, and conventional technologies competing in batteries can do very, very well. They're already doing well. But we're finding a subsidy in California, which mixed the two together. People think they're subsidizing the multi-hour stuff, but because of the accessibility of the short-term stuff, you're not doing that, um, unless there's a carve-out and there's been talk of that. And then batteries for vehicles, which of course gets nearly all the attention and has a completely different additional constraint. You, can, you, can, you have no weight penalty for these grid solutions. And uh, we had a great talk from Dan Steingart setting some of that out. Uh, the small modular reactors <coughs> claim to the nuclear strengths on this campus, which are uh, um, very large and impressive. We've had a group that started when I came to Princeton just shortly after in the early 70s, run by Frank von Hippel, still continuing, looking at the coupling of nuclear issues with each other. In particular, of interest to many of us is the coupling of nuclear power to nuclear weapons, the Iran dialogue. Um, uh, that was featured that front and center, and uh, just repeat, Egeman just mentioned that Ernie Moniz will be here to dedicate the NXTX this afternoon, was the hero of the uh, Iran negotiations with, Senator, with Secretary Kerry. Um, we made a point of, of dealing with nuclear power across the options that are being developed for small modular reactors through the lens of proliferation especially and realize that some of the suggestions are actually quite dangerous from the perspective of proliferation. Um, we also noted that we are about to, we have a lot of aging power plants in the United States, most more, but also in France and Japan, which are not likely to, uh, what, what will they be succeeded by in the not too distant future? There's very little discussion of that. The same goes for coal plants. We have an aging fleet like a faculty of all people over 50, and you've got to have a plan uh, for what comes next. We don't have one. Um, the question that is on my mind now, it wasn't so much on my mind a year ago and two years ago when we were writing this thing, was the small modular, modular reactors idea. We build things of about a quarter the size of today's standard nuclear reactors or smaller than that. Uh, they were going to come off of factories, therefore, therefore be cheaper, but there's a reason why we built bigger ones. Uh, bigger nuclear plants uh, the first time around. There are economies of scale. There was a, an idea underlying the uh, small modular reactor that we would be able to sell it to, to developing countries and talk them out of having any linkages to nuclear weapons in the process. They didn't like that kind of belittling of themselves that was implicit in what are called suppliers and users. And it may be that when that idea goes away, the whole thing goes away. I'm not sure, but there has not been a lot of take up. And there's been a conservatism about implementing them. All of that is in our, in, in our talk. And finally, how about all those faces? Ten of those people are graduate students. And four of them are on the podium. And they're the ones whose names are in red. Um, and I will introduce them when I stop in another moment or two. The, the, the uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, 
The, all of them are members of something called PECS, the Princeton Energy and Climate Scholars, which is housed in the Princeton Environmental Institute. It's an honor society. Faculty and students select the group. They serve for two years. They run their own program. And they chose as a project in 2014 the, uh, to, do, to learn something together that none of them knew anything about. Uh, the idea was these are students who are interested in energy and climate. They're, they're deeply into a particular project for their PhD, and they would like some leavening, some opportunity to work uh, on a broader problem and meet each other across different departments. There's, a, as you can see, there are quite a large range of departments. And, um, and the full, the, all of the students are, have their bios in the actual written report. I want, to, I want to just say a word about the fusion distillate itself. Um, it is an, an experiment in education. It's one of the most exciting experiments I've ever been part of because the students did throw themselves into this. We had very substantial help from experts in this subject at the same time as we were determined to write, and this may be quixotic, but we were determined to write something that would be taken seriously as neutral, not driven by plasma, by PPL's own pri priorities. And I think we've succeeded. We got technical help from them, but we were determinedly um, autonomous. We also had to take, uh, take the measure of the issue of ITER, for example, which is a very complex policy question. Um, and our two messages that I would single out that I learned, uh, one was that there were additional problems to the, on, above and beyond the ones many of us had heard about before in making these fusion reactors commercially viable based on the fact that there are materials challenges in the face of uh, neutrons, neutron bombardment, that uh, the community knows about but and are, for the most part, unsolved and are going to be critical to the success of this technology. And then this immense challenge of funding an international project whose cost has risen above $20 billion at the same time as one is sustaining a national program in the order of 30 to $40 million, 300 to $400 million in the United States. Um, as, a t as a 9 percent share of the total, and similar other countries having very similar problems. Well, enough of that intro. It's been a thrill for me to be part of this distillate program, and I, I think if we, we've done something which couldn't have been done in any other, any other unit in this university or any other university that I know of. Um, so, in order of how they're, of their speaking, Janam, why don't you raise your hand? As I mentioned, Janam is the Janam Javeri was the co-head of the program, of the, uh, of the whole project. He's a graduate of Purdue, and he is a Mater Fellow, which I hadn't learned until just today. I hadn't fully appreciated it, but the, we're in the auditorium the, the, of Mr. Mater, who also gave the uh, money for some uh, post from graduate student support. How many are there each year, uh, Emily? Uh, up to two. Very selective. Well, I understand why John won it, but I didn't realize it was quite that rare. Good. Um, he and I, he's the technology, we, he and a couple of others are the technology people in the group. He and I went down to a professional meeting of the Fusion Power Associates in Washington in December. He is the one who, he and I learned a lot together, and, uh, and it was a great experience. He's also been the head of PEX this past year, and he works in electrical engineering on solar on solar cells, silicon solar cells. Wei Peng uh, is from China. Um, she's working with Denise Moserol in the Woodrow Wilson School on Chinese energy systems, the air and water quality dimensions of the move toward renewables, the, the shipment of coal versus electrons from west to east in China, uh, tremendous appetite for learning, and she's on her way to the Kennedy School uh, for a postdoc next year in, uh, sci and again in energy policy, energy and climate policy with a China emphasis. Jane Baldwin, um, graduate of Harvard, a uh, member not only uh, of the, uh, uh, she's a climate modeler. She is in the science program at the geosciences department called Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, and she works at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, our, our fantastic neighbor, which is a laboratory of climate modeling out on Route 1. And um, she had a minor in East Asian Studies at college, and she has got that kind of appetite for, di for diverse learning that uh, we were recruiting for. And she also had an NSF fellowship, as did 4th Clio, 
both had NSF fellowships. Leo Chu, um, she is a graduate of, she is in the program at, at College in Evolutionary Biology. One of our, she was the co-chair with Jonam of the group. Jonam and she and I had a famous phone call when she was in Costa Rica, having just come out of the forest where she was measuring the, the mineral transport through trees uh, in the tropics, and uh, she is a graduate of Columbia. Um, so I think that might be. She also won an award of the, of the uh, Ecological Society of America called um, Graduate Student Policy Award. Okay, so I'm going to sit at the side, and they're going to talk. Okay, so, um, so my, as Ralph said, my name is John. I'm a fifth-year grad student in electrical engineering, and um, I was the chair of PECS this past year. Um, and I do want to say I'm really happy I joined PECS. Um, so I was working on solar cells, but I didn't really have a good understanding of the climate science and the policy side and the social sciences side of it. And I really got that experience through PECS. Um, and I absolutely think that the fusion desolate was a highlight of my graduate career here. So, um, shameless plug, if you're a graduate student and you're interested, definitely apply to PACS next year. Um, that said, as Rob was saying, I went to the FPA uh, meeting this past December. And I remember there was this uh, congressional staffer there, and he was talking about how a lot of these congressmen, they're really interested in fusion because it has so much potential, right? It's a base load power, low carbon, or all, like almost zero carbon, um, and it can actually power our economy for millions of years. The problem is they don't really understand how fusion works, and they're actually really confused. So this was actually, you know, when I heard this person talk, I was like, this is what the distal is for. It's perfect. Um, and so we're just going to talk a little bit about our experiences with the distal. So the distal itself, there's like six sections. There's the introduction, key concept, technology. Uh, we also talk about economics. We actually compare fusion to fission energy, and we also talk about policy. So I was mostly in charge of the technology section. And this was a really fascinating experience because we actually had three engineers. So myself, Arvind, uh, who was a fifth year grad student in electrical engineering, and Phil Hannum helped out as well, who actually got his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering. And so we went in there thinking like, you know, we're engineers, we can figure this out, how hard can it be? <laughs> Turns out a lot harder than, I, than we thought. Um, you know, it's, it, turned out, it, it was interesting that as, even as engineers, as PhD students in engineering, it was extremely challenging to go to a different field and actually understand what was going on, what the subtleties were, what the real challenges were, uh, you know, where the biases were of the experts, like, you know, who do we trust, what do we trust, and to not only take all that information and learn it and understand it, but then to also distill it to actually make it into a language that was easy to comprehend. Uh, it was something that I didn't fully appreciate, just how hard it is to really take a complex scientific uh, concept and actually explain it simply enough that a congressional staffer could understand. Congressional staffer being someone with maybe one or two classes, uh, college classes in physics and chemistry. So that was a huge challenge. And something else that I also learned was that to be really mindful of what's written in the media. Um, so one example was Pi Alpha, which is a private company. So what they do is they do like for a photon boron reaction. And the products are three helium particles, three alpha particles, hence the name Pi Alpha. And so this particular reaction, when you read the media, you think like, wow, this is great because they don't have this issue of neutrons. You don't have neutrons, you don't have neutron bombardment on the first wall, which is a huge problem. <laughs> so, you know, we started reading, we thought, like, you know, why aren't more people working on it? And then we learned more and more, we talked more and more with experts, and we found out that, sure, there's this benefit of this proton boron reaction. There's also a lot of negatives. Uh, one is you need a different type of confinement system. Two is that the benefits aren't as fantastic as we'd expect. So, if you have an advanced tokamak reactor design, uh, you can go above 50% efficiency, even with a proton boron reaction, at best, if you have a direct conversion to electricity, okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Hello? All right. All right. Okay, so, I bet, like, even if you have direct conversion to electricity, you have 100%, so at best, you have a factor of two improvement. 
And finally, this is the most fascinating part for me, like goes back to my own research. So I work on solar cells, uh, crystalline silicon solar cells, which today dominate the market. And so obviously when I talk to people in my own narrow subfield, there's a lot of bias, you know, like we're great, we're gonna dominate the market for years to come, like organic PV have nothing on us, like these like things called, uh, you know, whatever, all these other different technologies, it's not gonna happen. And the fascinating thing was I started seeing these same biases appear in fusion, where you had people in magnetic confinement fusion saying like, you know, we got this, we're doing well. And then people in inertial confinement saying like, no, no, we got this, we're gonna get it done. And then you had the private sector. And I started seeing like how, yeah, as experts, we do come in with our own biases. And actually realizing and kind of getting hit in the face where it's like, wait, I talk like this too. Uh, <laughs> was a really valuable experience. So uh, that said, like, once again, this was an absolute highlight. Um, and I really appreciate Rob Saklo for letting us do this um, as well. And I'll, I'll give it, I'll pass it on to Wei, who's going to talk about her experiences with the policy side. Yeah. Um, I kind of think that this was a very good learning experience to me. I feel that as a PhD, we're learning new things every day, but this is still something very different. Um, I think one thing I find really valuable across, uh, throughout this process is that we need to make very hard decisions to take things out so that we can have a distant list. I think this is a very important lesson to me because I'm in the policy school, and I know that most policymakers don't have time for more than two pages of summary. So this kind of exercise is kind of like as a student, as a researcher, I kind of think everything I do is so important. But this is a good exercise to kind of like think from the other side, thinking about what information that are important for policymakers and what kind of important message is important for general public to understand. And we just want to provide enough information, but not biased. Um, I can give you two examples that are the things we took out from this discipline. You won't see it. Uh, the first thing is, because I personally, my personal research is on this air quality co-benefits of renewable deployment in China. So when I started this fusion project, I was thinking, fusion is the same thing. Fusion is zero emitting in both carbon emissions and air pollution. So what about thinking about this air quality co-benefits as a justification, justification for fusion as well? But then I realized uh, gradually, with some help from my colleagues too, is actually um, not a very strong argument for fusion. Two reasons. One is that when we're thinking about fusion actual deployment, we're thinking about time horizon after 2050. And by then, um, according to a lot of air pollution emission uh, scenarios, it's very likely that even in a very coal intensive scenario, most of the coal power generation plants will have annual pipe control. That means that deploying fusion at that time horizon won't give out that much air quality co-benefits. And the second reason is that um, I personally believe air quality co-benefits is a very important reason to encourage more renewable deployment today. But it's a different story to use this near-term air quality co-benefits to uh, in kind of like justify this huge amount of R&D funding into something that is still a little bit uncertain in the long run. So these are the things we take out. And another thing we took out, I'm really glad that Sharon asked a question about the private, uh, all the private fusion project, because that's something initially we thought this is amazing. We, should, uh, we actually compiled a list of all the private uh, fusion projects in the Excel spreadsheet. Um, and we think these things, uh, they, they are actually, um, they receive a lot of news attention. And so we think it, maybe this is something important we should know, general public should know, and policymakers should know. But after spending some time looking into their website, looking into uh, a lot of information about them, um, I think, of course, there are variations across different fusion projects. For example, Triafa is the one that has more, much more information than the others. Um, but in general, we don't think there is adequate information to really tease out to what extent is marketing, to what extent they have concrete technology progress. So um, I think this echoes what Rob and Ackman said just now. I feel that as a, someone who don't know, know nothing about fusion before, I kind of like, when I read the news, like, it's easy for me to get that perception from what they wrote in the news. But it's a really different story after spending some time and thinking about uh, whether or not this source information about this private fusion project is as valid as the other information we provided for magne magnetic confinement fusion technology. So I think these two are the things that's no longer in the distillate, but something we have spent some time on. And I think this is a good exercise in general uh, for me, and maybe for the others too, um, to think about uh, how much information is adequate. 
Um, and also, I also think Jenna made a very good point that as a researcher, it's so important to be bilingual uh, in a sense that we need to, on the one hand, um, talk about our research in a very rigorous way, but at the same time, try to talk about something everyone can understand. And I think this, this distillate is a really uh, practice for me to think about how can I uh, distill my research and maybe fusion research in general uh, in a way people could understand. Um, then Jane. Um, so as Rob said, I'm a graduate student in atmospheric and oceanic sciences, which uh, I actually work at GFDL, which is on the same campus as PPPL, but my own research has nothing to do with it. Um, in my own research, I typically run idealized experiments with climate models. So most recently, I've been running an experiment where I get rid of the Tibetan plateau in a coupled climate model. Um, and this has implications for the Asian monsoons and various tropical cyclones, various topics that I'm trying to analyze. Um, and I'll get back to an analogy I'm going to make with that project later on. But um, I was really excited about the idea of working on fusion from the start because I spend all day characterizing the problem of climate change. And it's, it's very important work, I think. We really need to be able to move towards better regional predictions of climate change. But it's left me kind of wishing, gosh, I wish I... Some days I wake up and I sort of wish I worked on the energy side because that's really where, that's where the solutions are. It seemed so intriguing to me. And fusion seemed like the ultimate solution among all the solutions I've heard about, you know, low carbon, base load, unlimited fuel. And um, in particular, um, and beyond that, I really didn't know that much about fusion. The only other things I knew were delays with ITER and that it was very expensive. Um, and so the question I kind of was fascinated by from the start is how much would it cost to get to a working fusion reactor? Um, and so I ended up working on the economics and policy sections of the distillate. And I, I had this pretty naive vision in my head that if, if people better appreciated the cost versus benefit of it, we could just get a group of billionaires somehow in my head, there's a group of billionaires sitting around out there that would come over and fund fusion and the world would be safe. I'm a PhD student, I still get to have excited. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, um, as I started to dig into the literature, though, I realized that the cost of fusion really needed to be understood in a more complex dynamical context, in the same way that the influence of a mountain on climate can't be understood in isolation. You, you could think about, you know, what's the influence of a mountain on atmospheric circulation, but unless you have the ocean, the atmosphere, the land, various parameterizations for issues you don't understand well, there's a lot you're going to be missing, and you won't be able to simulate things in a realistic manner. Similarly, when we started thinking about what's the value of fusion, because you need to have a sense of the value in order to motivate what cost you're willing to pay, that gets to the question, what will fusion's future market share be? And we started working with um, looking at results from integrated assessment models, in particular, in particular um, focus on the energy market part of the models. Try to understand do we believe estimates of Fusion's future market share? What are the main factors that could influence Fusion's future market share? And we're looking at time horizon of, you know, end of the century, for example. Um, and, and what these, the results from these models indicate is there are certain circumstances where Fusion energy would be incredibly valuable. However, there are other circumstances where it would be more marginally valuable. For example, if carbon capture and sequestration turned out to be really successful, if we don't end up with a carbon tax anytime soon. And, and so I, I just, it was really interesting to see the evolution of my thinking from the start to the end of this project, much as when I started out thinking about the influence of mountains on climate, I had this idea you could think about them in isolation. Similarly, in thinking about the influence of fusion on the energy market, you can't just price a future reactor in isolation. You really have to think about the whole picture of what's going to happen with the energy system. And it's also why it's 
great that there's something like this symposium where we have all these people in the same room who can talk about what the future of the energy system will be from a bunch of different perspectives. So that's what I got out of it. I also thought it was a very valuable experience and it was wonderful to work with everyone here. And I guess I'm the last to speak. And as Rob said, I'm an ecologist. And for my dissertation, I study how soil nutrients can constrain the carbon sink in tropical forests. And I do this with both field experiments in Costa Rica, but also with forest simulation modeling. Um, and for the distillate, I also worked on the economics chapter with Jane, and I also um, helped write the introduction. So um, when we started this project, I was wondering how, as an ecologist, I could transfer my skills to uh, fusion science, which seems very, very different. Um, but as we worked on the project through time, I actually saw that it was, um, there were actually very uh, similar uh, kind of broad level concepts. So one thing we really care about in ecology is how many, many different interacting components, all with different characteristics, so for example, all the species in a forest with their different traits um, interact with each other to result in emergent level properties. So in the case of my research, uh, carbon sequestration and carbon sinks. Um, so similarly, when I was w working on the economics chapter, we were looking at all the components um, that led to the price of fusion energy, which would result in understanding how competitive it is uh, in the future when it comes becomes available. And one thing we really care about in ecology are uh, components that have a disproportionate effect on whatever emergent property we care about, so like a keystone species. And um, after spending a lot of time in the primary, primary literature looking at all the component costs of a fusion reactor, one that jumped out to me as very interesting was the cost of um, having to do scheduled component replacements in fusion reactors. So um, like we've heard from Eggman's talk and probably some of the other things people have said, uh, there's a lot of irradiation in fusion reactors due to the neutron bombardments. And um, that requires uh, some parts to be replaced, need to be replaced through time. So the diverter and the first wall of the reactor. Um, and as we looked into the literature on this, it was really fascinating to me that um, because these are uh, radioactive materials, when these changes need to be made, um, you need to use robots to make the changes. So it takes a long time, it's like four to six months to make the change of the diverter and or the first wall. Um, and then because the reactor is so complex, you also have to spend a month months worth of time beforehand to cool down the machine and then after you do the change you have to do spend a month's worth of time to recondition it before it can start generating energy again. So if you add this all together this has a huge um, effect on the cost of fusion energy. So if it takes approximately six months if you're doing that once a year it can double the price of fusion energy because you can only run your power plant half the time. Um, but luckily, fusion scientists are aware of this concern, so they can aim to like run, have fusion power plants run continuously for two years at a time before they need to replace these components. Um, so that was interesting to me to see how um, different uh, components of the cost can have really, really big uh, impacts on the price of fusion. And the other thing, when I was working on the introduction, kind of like how uh, Jane said her personal views on fusion went through cycles. Um, it was interesting for me to try to synthesize the work as a whole, ev what everything, every, what all the other team members were working on. And uh, I also saw the evolution through time of how um, the group's optimism towards fusion changed. So in the beginning, when you're just trying to write down the like, uh, outline of the introduction, uh, the first things you describe are fusion's attributes, so base load, you can build it almost anywhere in the world, um, very limitless uh, energy uh, resources, re fuel sources required, so it sounds really, really wonderful. But then as we worked on the project, and I also have to thank Rob for really challenging us to think critically, for example, like 
how, how can we think about these economic studies of power plants? Like, are they working from bottom up or up down from a price that they think is uh, economically feasible? Uh, we started seeing our optimism as a group going down due to all the challenges, but I hope that, um, and I feel, and I think the group feels as a whole, we've arrived at a balanced point and a very neutral perspective. So obviously there are many, many uh, wonderful qualities of fusion energy, um, but in the distillate, which I hope you will read, you'll also see that we describe the challenges um, that do exist and are real. Okay. So I guess I will take the questions, although where's our chair? Does he do that or do I do that? Okay, I'll do that. Egerman, we need to wait for Mike and say who you are. It's Egerman Coleman. I just talk so people I remember it. Um, so uh, you did a great job, first of all. And um, without any help, by the way, from us. You were one of the people who gave us a lot of help. Well, well we, we, we just, you know, looked at some things, but not... But um, my main question is, uh, when you read articles or, or any of these scientific publications on these things, how, how, how did you judge them in terms of, like, how were you able to judge their correctness? Because you're not an expert in the field. So how was that process? Who wants to take that? I think uh, I can start. Um, I think to some degree it depended on what section you were thinking about. So, so for example, um, people thinking about the policy section, um, some individuals in the group are graduate students in the Woodrow Wilson School who think about topics that um, are very similar um, about uh, funding uh, of research um, and also kind of international cooperation on issues. So I felt in some areas, uh, individuals in the group were quite well equipped to judge. I think certainly in the technology section that was more difficult and also um, in the economic section, I think at first we were kind of just grabbing any publication we could find. But I think there was, I mean, we were working on this project over two years. And as I said, our, our views evolved over time, partially through some interventions at points like when we met with you and Rob and Rob Goldston. Uh, Rob Goldston and other oh, this, Rob. This Rob. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so there are definitely some tracks we went down that um, we, we realized that were less correct. But I think it, it, part of the reason why the project took the length of time it did is it took that long for us to get up to speed enough that we could start to evaluate whether something we were reading was accurate or not. Um, but it, that, that's a process that's hard to make so quickly. Why don't, why don't we go to another question and then pick that up, if there is one. Yeah. Bob Harris. Uh, follow up on the, uh, <clears throat> on the expert uh, question. Uh, did you um, have a protocol to share, say, a penultimate draft with a number of experts to get their feedback? And then how did you, when did that happen, and how did you handle comments, I would imagine that they could be quite contradictory, depending on whether they come from university research people or private sector people. Um, so I'll start answering that question. Um, even though the distillate is not a technically like, published in a peer-reviewed journal, I want to say that it was actually probably way more peer-reviewed than any work I will publish in a peer-reviewed journal. <laughs> um, so in the very beginning, we put together an early draft, and that's when we had Eggman and Rob Goldston <laughs> look at it. Um, but then I think maybe after a year into the process, um, we had round one of our reviews. So Rob uh, sent the distillate, uh, helped send the distillate to many, many experts in the field. Um, that he knew, um, and in total, I think we had ten uh, like experts in fusion and like energy policy, that kind of thing, uh, review it. And so the first round, they had some time to look through the whole document. Many people gave very, very detailed comments. Some more higher level, some more detailed. 
Um, and we went through every single comment um, and thought about it and edited, discussed it with the, as a group. Um, and that whole process, it took maybe like two months. And then we did it again. Uh, so sent back to some of the same people, some different, um, and then incorporated those comments once again. If I could add one thing, it was interesting that we asked the re reviewers in the first round if they'd like, would willing to look at the second round, and they all said yes. They cared enough that this be right. And we had just as extensive comments almost in the second round. Yeah, I also want to point out that we did have experts from other institutes as well. So we had, uh, I believe, Bob Rosner from University of Chicago, Dennis White from MIT. We also had Bill Brinkman from, who worked at the DOE, and, and obviously people at PPPL as well, like Stuart Preger. So we definitely had a very wide range uh, of experts to actually look at it. Another point I want to add about this point, because I think when you're reading through the comments, there is a very clear sign that some of them are basically we didn't write it in an accurate way. But the other comments is clear that there is, is um, I work on the policy chapter. So you could imagine that um, the framing really matters in the policy chapter, how you describe things. So I think uh, it's very clear that some of the other comments have some um, kind of like your perception about the future of uh, fusion energy in it. And, and I, I think we kind of want to make the distinction of what are the comments that we really need to address because this is really, we, we would like to um, make no, mis we don't want to make any mistake when describe the technology, but there are other things we want to be as unbiased as possible. In other words, we were lobbied a bit. Tell us how you got the pricing uh, right. Uh, as uh, someone in, in a general contractor in one of my past lives, um, I know that uh, getting the, the component prices for something that has never been built yet, and also the soft costs associated with it, um, is always a challenge. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about your um, research into pricing or co of the costs? Um, so I guess Jane and I worked on that and uh, first of all we had a helpful meeting with Eric Larson who works on uh, thinking about costing of uh, future technologies but very quickly we learned that yeah this for fusion it's considered much more far off than what people normally do costing uh, predictions for um, but we, so we didn't make any cost estimations ourselves. We went to the primary literature and there have been, I think we found like 20 studies um, starting in, as early as the 1970s until uh, modern day. Um, and we looked at what, uh, so these are all published scientific reports on costs for fusion power plant. Um, but yeah, we knew, so if you read the distillate in the economics chapter, you'll see that um, it's clear from the peer-reviewed articles we read um, and our synthesis that this is still a very, very uncertain um, com component. So we're just highlighting things that we think will play a large role in the cost, but at this point, I think it's very uh, difficult for anyone to pinpoint the exact cost, and it depends on many technological and other issues. So our approach was a meta-analysis, basically, of existing studies in the literature. Other questions? I, I'm, one, one last one up there from Barry. Okay, one, la one last question. As, a, as an author of an upcoming and yet, as yet unfinished distillate, and perhaps there are other co-authors or future authors of not yet formed distillates, how does it feel when you finished it? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you a comment, because um, we actually shared it on Facebook. And uh, one of our co-authors, like Arvin, he graduated like six months ago. And he posted a comment saying, like, I feel more relieved about this than my thesis. <laughs> <laughs> and Arvin works for the Livermore Lashing Lab now in California. Maybe we should quit with that marvelous comment, which I've not heard before. So let's, let's give them a round of applause, and I'd like to make a final couple of comments.